Well, good afternoon, everybody in local government. Um, welcome to uh, this uh, broadcast today in the Lunch and Learn series. Uh, I just wanted to make sure, first thing first, uh, I just want to check to make sure that I'm being heard. So could you just indicate in the, in the uh, question box, please just write the word clear. That just let, lets me know you're out there and you can hear me, which means that I'm not talking to myself for the full hour. So could you just do that for me, please? Thanks, Blake. Right. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Andrea. Excellent. All right. Thank you, uh, Ellen. Eileen, thank you. All right, welcome. Um, welcome, everybody. And uh, I hope that I'm going to give you some provocative information to be thinking about here in local government uh, in our series on organisational structures. So let's get underway. Um, you, you'd be aware now, of course, that we're um, well and truly into our program. And just to do a quick uh, Reminder about what we've been doing. Uh, we've, we 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 looked at um, we looked at strategically managing performance in the first particular webinar. Uh, we did we also looked then at uh, influencing skills, and I got you to complete the influencing capabilities framework. Um, we talked about creating thinking space and managing our time last time, and I hope that you've had a chance to to try a few of those techniques. And today we're going to look at uh, options for organisational structuring. And the reason why we're going to look at that is that I think that it'd be fair to say, and you'll probably be in a better position than I would, but local government is very, it's very, uh, how should I say, it's very functionally based. We've got silos in local government uh, around specialties. Now, I don't necessarily think that's a bad idea. But it does cause some issues, doesn't it, in terms of internal communication and one department talking to another and so on. So it does create some issues for us. Um, so I just want to provoke our thinking a little bit about that this afternoon and get us to think a little bit differently about things and how we might go about doing, uh, doing things slightly differently. Whether you're head of a department or a team or whether you're in charge of the whole organisation, we've got lots of people in different positions here. We're going to look at a couple of those options that you might find very useful uh, in terms of restructuring or, or structuring your workplace. Okay, so there's basically three things that I want to cover today. And um, I'll spend a bit, bit of time on each of these three things, of course. But initially, I want to talk about what, what are your options. So if you were looking at restructuring your department or your organisation, what might you consider? What might be some things to consider? And structuring is important because the way we structure ourselves dictates the way we behave. And the way we behave, of course, has a huge impact on our ability to perform. What's interesting about local government, like all organisations, is that the community the community that you serve just sees one organisation. You know, they don't see they don't see necessarily the administration department, or they don't see the um, you know they don't see engineering, or they just see one organisation. So when they're dealing with you, they're dealing with one entity, or at least in their own mind, that's how it should be. And in your case, what happens, of course, is that you're aware that there's a whole lot of interesting, intricate structures going on within the one entity. We're going to look at the concept of uh, the ambidextrous organisation, which sounds like an interesting title, and it is. Ambidexterity normally means that we can use both hands. So if you're, a, if you're an ambidextrous tennis player, you can play tennis with both your left and right hand. So what does it mean when it comes to organisations? And uh, finally, we'll end up talking about some of the tools for agility. So how do we become more agile? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do, become more agile so that we can be more responsive to the needs of the community. And the reality is um, 
tax, you know, rates go, rates can keep going up, but to a point. Um, so what gives? Is it services? Is it rates? We're in that very difficult uh, situation now, and you're no, you're not unique to this in local government, where the public are expecting, um, you know, certain uh, services. Uh, and they're expecting good value for money. And of course, now we've got to think about how we do things smarter, faster, safer, easier. And all of these things can be, uh, they can be impeded by the way you organize yourself or the way you organize yourself can actually be a great benefit in terms of that. So that's why we're looking at this topic this afternoon. So like every other topic, if you've got questions, comments, observations, type them in the question box. I'll stop when I see a question or a comment there and I'll, I'll address it. Okay, that's the quid pro quo. I'll stop and I'll address it. If you just want to make a statement or share your own experiences or ask me a question, then go for your life and do that. And if you forget and you think of something when you finish this, then just send me an email and I'm more than happy to hear from you in between sessions. That's part of the deal. All right, so let's look at your options. The local government organisations, and I've yet to see one that's not set up this way, are based on this, this functional model or what we might call this hierarchical model. I've just got a simple one there on the screen, but you know what I'm getting at, where basically we have a number of different functions in the organisation and that, you know, extends down the organisation. Often when I say to a CEO in local government, um, can I see your org chart? 99.9% .9 of the time, in fact, I can't remember any time this wasn't the case, they will show me a functional model. And that's been how it's been for a long time in local government, but I'm quite convinced that it does provide some advantages, but I also think it has a lot of disadvantages. And I would suggest to you as an executive or a senior officer, I would strongly recommend you start thinking seriously about how you might even tinker with your organisational structure to make it more effective because um, we all know that the big issue in local government, and I can talk to you because I've been involved in consulting in local government for a long time, we all know the issue is communication cross-functionally. We all know that the finance department sometimes doesn't talk to, the, to human resources or human resources doesn't talk to um, marketing or whatever it might be. And we get a situation where a lack of communication means that the person on the receiving end of the service, that is the public, uh, often don't get what they want. So it does create some problems for us. Um, and often people feel less reluctant to cross functional boundaries because of the way the organization is set up. But yet the interesting thing about this is that really, let's face it, if you think about a lot of the things that you do in local government, they do transcend boundaries, uh, functional boundaries. Normally, in any reasonable size transaction with the public, you're going to have a series of particular departments involved in that in some way, shape or form. So therefore, the cross-functional communication is critically important. So I'm going to challenge you to think about this. Now, most government organisations, of course, are set up around the functional model. And really, the functional model has served us very well when we're in a very stable um, environment, you know, where everything's totally predictable, funding's predictable, the public demands are predictable, um, you know, the economy is predictable. In those sorts of stable situations, the hierarchical model is fine because it adds a degree of stability. But of course, we're moving into an interesting age, aren't we, where everything's up for grabs. 
Um, do we outsource this? Do we keep this as part of our functional role? Um, you know, will funding continue in its current form? Uh, can we increase rates? What are the expectations that the public have of us? And all of these things are up for grabs, as we know. So the functional role is under the functional model is under enormous pressure. So let's look at some other models. Now I'm not suggesting that these other models are ideal for local government, but what I do want to share with you is how some private enterprise organisations might be set up. And I just really want to open up your thinking this afternoon to give you an opportunity to think differently, perhaps about the way you might like to structure the people that work with you. Now, as I said before, what I'm showing you here is not so much an organisational model. I'm just simply making a point here that when the public deal with you, that is you personally or you as a council, they're dealing with what they perceive to be one entity. So they are really just wanting whatever it is that they want resolved or fixed or uh, queried, they just want their answer. And they're not at all interested about how you're structured or how you're organised. They don't really care, they just want their thing fixed and, and done. So we've got to understand that from a public perspective, um, they're dealing with one entity in their mind. All right, it might be they might be aware that there's a couple of people that they have to go through. Maybe there's a customer service officer, and that customer service officer has uh, led them to town planning, and the town planner sits down and works with us. But at the end of the day, they're really they really have this perception that council should be a seamless operation, and as we all know, it's not because there are all these boundaries. So it's just important for us to acknowledge that the public themselves are not interested in all of these boundaries and uh, structures and everything else. They just want efficiency and they just want effectiveness. And I guess that's what we want too. So we've got to make sure that our structures don't get in the way of efficiency and effectiveness. Now, another way to structure, and I'm, as I said before, this is not, I'm not suggesting councils should set up this way, but you'll find in the private sector there is another model approach. There's really three different ways that you can structure an organisation, and whilst we can function it around, we can structure it around the functional model where we're actually putting people in different functional specialties. We can also, or in the private sector at least, they can organise themselves around the product model. In other words, the so-called departments are actually centred around particular products. So you'll find this quite a lot in a construction or an electronics industry and these kinds of things where each of those um, are based on a particular product. So you have the digital products or the elect electrical products or the domestic products or the new products. And within each of those particular silos, we have a human resources, an administrative officer, a financial person. So we actually have all our specialties uh, centered around products and not around the specialties. The problem, of course, with this approach, as you could probably well and truly understand, is that it still creates silos in terms of communication. In other words, the domestic products may not talk to the electrical products because they're in separate silos, even though there might be a possibility of exchanging leads or drawing upon the resources of one and not the other. So this can actually create the same sort of problems that the functional model can create. And the other problem with this product model is that when you want to create a new product, let's say that there's a new product that's been developed and come on the market, it's a bit difficult to be able to get that into the structure. And the reason for that is that the other product function, uh, product um, silos, if you like, will often do everything they can to prevent this new product um, silo from getting off the ground. The reason for that is that this new product may poach some of the human resources from these other 
um, silos, and that creates a bit of a problem. So it's, um, it's not ideal, but what it does do is um, it means that everything that's said, done, and thought about in these silos are directed towards a particular product. So it's a little bit more customer focused than the uh, than the than the uh, functional model I just shared with you. But of course, it's probably not applicable in local government. I'm not suggesting it should be. I'm just opening up the possibilities of other ways of looking at things. So yes, some organisations do uh, set themselves up that way. The third way is a kind of like a combination of the two. So um, this is what we call the matrix model. And there are lots of organisations that are set up around uh, the matrix, matrix model. And what the matrix model does is you've got, as you can see there across the top, you've got your functional um, uh, silos. So they remain, but in order to break down the uh, cross-functional communication issues that I talked about, they put in a number of different projects or platforms. So for example, um, you've got, you know, as you can see on the screen, you've got your digital and you've got your uh, electrical and domestic and product uh, approaches. So what this does in effect is create a situation where you each individual employee has pretty much two bosses. They have their functional boss and when they're working in a project environment then they have their project manager. Um, if that relationship can be managed effectively it can work extremely well but my experience is that it, ha it doesn't always work effectively. And uh, we have a situation often where there's a power struggle between two bosses. There is the operations boss, for example, at loggerheads with the digital products uh, project manager. And both of them are sort of wrestling for the resources or the priorities of the people that happen to reside in those functions and those projects. But as I said, if it's managed effectively, it can be very useful. I think there's huge scope in local government for us to start to look at this particular model. Um, I would like to suggest that there aren't enough cross-functional project teams in local government where the teams that are cross-functional are really made up of members of the functional areas who come together and collaborate around a particular project. I know it can happen in local government when you've got a major project on the go, but I think there's opportunities for this to be created in local government. So, um, but of course, what has to be managed, as I said before, is the leadership function, where you make sure that the individual uh, is very clear about who they report to about what, and that the, both of those leaders don't encroach on the other, on the turf of the, you know, their other leader that the person has to belong to. I mean, for example, if you look at that model and there's somebody working working in operations and they're also in the digital product area, um, they're going to be torn between loyalty between the project, which in this case is digital products, and the operational um, you know, function. So, um, you know, rivalry and uh, competition and all of those sorts of things is not the name of the game. The whole reason that the, the matrix model came into play, incidentally, was to try to break down these silos and to make them more, uh, you know, to, be able to get people to communicate more effectively with each other. So that's another approach, um, a third approach. Now, um, in my latest book, um, performance management for agile organizations, I put together another model. Now, this is unique. Uh, I mean, I have seen some uh, concentric organizational models before, 
but I'd like to think that this is unique. It's something I've put together because it seemed to me that there needed to be more opportunities or more options open to managers to consider how they might run their affairs. And you'll notice that a couple of interesting things in the model. You'll notice that the customers are in the middle. And uh, so because the customer is in the middle, that actually, and it, look, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that if you look at most organisational charts, you don't see anything about customers or ratepayers or community members or whatever you want to call them. They're not even featured on the chart, which if you actually think about it, is quite interesting because at the end of the day, that's our whole reason for existence, isn't it? The fact that we are servicing somebody else. And so what the first thing I'd say about my model is that I'm putting them front and centre. The reason I put them front and centre is we shouldn't we should remind ourselves that we're actually in that business. Then you have here a front line. Now the front line are the people that deal directly with the customers. So obviously in local government you would have um, a large amount of customer service officers who would be in this front line, but they're not the only ones that deal in the front line with uh, with the public. So anyone that deals directly with the public would be in this particular um, layer of the chart. You might say, well, what are these dotted lines here? Well, these dotted lines are actually the departments. So my model still allows the idea of departments. All right, so this could be corporate services and this is the customer service offices, for example. So the you'll notice though that they're dotted lines. In other words, we don't want them to dominate the the the, the organizational chart. We we you know we, we want them to we we want to acknowledge that there are specialties inside the council, but we don't want them to dominate to a point where there is not cross functional communication. The next layer is the operations. These are the people that provide the services to the front line in order for them to do their job, which in a council environment would be the bulk of people. So they'd be in this area here, of course. You've got indoor and outdoor staff, and uh, the bulk of people would be here, and they'd be represented in their various departments. Now, um, so you, you know, and then of course you would populate these, you know, and indicate who the people are and who the leaders are and so forth. Um, now, another reason that I've drawn this out as a circle, I'm not suggesting that you need to go down this road. I'm just, as I said, opening up your mind to the possibilities of what you might be able to do and not be just hamstrung by the, the good old functional model. Um, the other reason why I've drawn it out this way, apart from having the customers in the middle, is that I'm trying to get away from this concept of hierarchy that the person at the top knows best and the person at the bottom doesn't know that much because that's actually nonsense. I think some of the people at the coalface actually have a better grasp of what's going on than the senior officers in a council. And so this this notion of, of setting the, the, you know, the chart up this way is really getting rid of this concept that somebody at the top has greater knowledge. In fact, if you look at where the managers are here, they're actually on the outer rim. So the managers are the circumference, if you like, of the organisations. And you'll notice that there are no dots. So there are no departments depicting that. So that these managers should be bringing one hat to their meetings, and that is the organisational hat and not the functional hat. And one of the problems at your level, and I'm talking, of course, to you who are senior people in your organisations, is that when you go to your meetings, you're often talking about your functional area. And that's fine. I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't have some accountability for that. But let's face it, when you come together with other senior people, you should be talking about what's in the best interests of the organisation, first and foremost, 
before you start talking about your functional areas of responsibility. Now you'll notice one other thing in here, which is projects. Now, what I mean there is this is a whole raft of different cross-functional projects. And I would suggest to you that everybody uh, in the organization ideally should be involved in one of these cross-functional project teams. I'll talk about this in a little bit more depth later on in the presentation. And you might say, well, what would these projects entail? Well, I've made a list of those things here, and there are only a few things of what you might consider. For example, workplace culture. I mean, could there be a project team that looks after how we might improve the culture of our workplace? Could we have a project team that looks after awards and incentives and considers uh, how that might be administered inside our organisation? Could we have an innovation and continuous improvement team, a team that actually garners all the ideas and thoughts and ways of making the organisation more efficient and effective? Normally, most organisations have a safety and, and well-being team. Um, that's, you know, the, probably the oldest cross-functional team that we have. What about recruitment and selection? Is it possible that we could get that as a project team and not take it out of the human resources hands and give it an opportunity for other people to consider how we can make our processes more efficient and effective, particularly in those regional areas where it's difficult to attract good people? And what about if we had a product and service development team? Well, that may not be applicable so much to local government, but nevertheless, um, you can see the idea of what I'm talking about with project teams. So there's food for thought. I'd like you to have a think about whether that might be something that you might like to consider uh, as such. I've just got a question here and I'll just respond to that. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Customers could also be called consumers. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. Um, you can call them whatever you like, but I think the reality is uh, I think that it's quite interesting that the people that we serve, and in fact, I wouldn't be doing this webinar if it wasn't for you, and you wouldn't be doing this webinar if it wasn't for people who um, pay their rates. So at the end of the day, why wouldn't we put whoever we want to call them at the centre of our existence? Um, call them consumers, call them customers, whatever. Thanks, Blake, for your comment. Yeah, it really is up to you what you want to call them, but you know what I'm talking about when I refer to them. All right, so let's talk about this concept of ambidextrous organisations. Now, this is a big challenge for local government, and I think that what I'm... There was a very famous Harvard Business Review feature a number of years ago. It was a very famous article in the Harvard Business Review um, that was put, and it was called exactly that, the ambidextrous, ambidextrous organization, which is a wonderful title. And all it's really getting at is that we need to be ambidextrous along the lines of this. On the one hand, we have to be able to be stable and rigid and have strength and you know we need to have a structure and we need to be compliant and we need to be accountable and we need to be transparent and a whole bunch of other things we need in short to be a regulatory environment right that's the fact because uh, you know it's a public sector organization but the problem is we're often so rigid in that that the other side of it, which is kind of like a, a seesaw, the other side of it is that we will sometimes struggle with our speed and our flexibility and our adaptability and how we, you know, can uh, manoeuvre things. And what we really want is a seesaw that is evenly balanced. We want to be able to be both. And what this article and of course, you can just Google it. It's a very simple thing to Google and you'll find you'll get it straight on your screen. 
But what we need to do in local government is is to be able to uh, equalise the scales, if you like. So we need to be able to create a situation where we're both um, agile and also compliant. And they argue that you can be both. You don't have to be one or the other. And you could say if you went into a... Um, if you went into a startup IT firm, which is clearly going to be very agile, but probably not reg very regulatory and have very immature systems in place, that their challenge is not to become more agile, but their challenge is to become more regulatory. So every organisation has its struggles with, with getting the scales balanced. And our struggle in local government, of course, is to be agile. So it's a concept that's well worth thinking about. And from your point of view as a senior leader, your job is to think, how can we accommodate both regulation and agility at the same time? That's how the concept works. And uh, this very busy slide, which should come up on your screen fairly soon, here it comes, uh, really shows you the difference between the two and the issues around that as such. So if you look, you've got some headings down here on the left-hand side, and over here you have some hierarchical, this is the uh, typical way, of course, local government is set up, and over here you have the, some of the ways of being agile, and you'll notice that they're obviously in conflict. So if you look at, for example, power, Power in local government is very concentrated around the people who are at the executive level and heads of their various departments because that's the way it's set up. But we also need to be quite distributive. We want everybody in the organisation to bring their thoughts, concepts and ideas together in terms of being able to uh, um, you know, balance things as such. We want to, people to come together with their ideas and their thoughts and so forth. So you can see that this is a this is a diametrically opposite challenge. So what we've got to try and do is to create two sets of values. One, we will stick to, you know, a particular regulatory environment and how we need to do things. But on the other hand, we've also got to add a degree of flexibility. Now how would you do this practically? Well, one of the most practical things that you can do, and I've seen it happen before, and I've actually been involved in it, is you get your team together and you get a whiteboard out and you ask your team, you draw two lines down the centre of the whiteboard, so you have effectively three, three um, columns. And on the left-hand side, you ask your team, what are some things that, where we have to do things by the book? What are the things that we have no real room at all? We have to follow the system, the process and what have you. And obviously there are things like safety and regulatory audit, audits and, and, and so forth. And you won't have any problems getting people making a list of those things. So you actually get your team involved in this conversation. And then over on the right hand side, that's the far column, you ask people, what are some things that we do that are open to how we go about doing them? So where, are, where do we have, where can we show complete initiative? What are those areas? And we make a list of those. It's highly likely that list isn't going to be as long but nevertheless, you persevere and try and get as many of those things as you possibly can. And then you've got a middle column where you can ask people, where is it possible that we could either be, you know, regulatory or agile? And you talk to them about that. Now, by doing that list, you're opening up the minds of the people in the room, that is your team, around some areas where personal initiative and enterprise is actually important, whilst at the same time reinforcing the need to be quite hierarchical or, you know, very regulatory when you need to be. And in that middle column, you can, uh, you can talk to people about 
how you might deal with certain unique situations. Is it something that needs to be regulatory or is it something that needs to be open to agility? All right, so you have that kind of uh, dichotomy. So that's a very practical thing that you can do um, and, you know, and then just reinforce that in your conversations with people around how you might do things in that way. So that's a practical exercise that you can do to create that. All right, now in my book here, um, Performance Management for Agile Organisations, my latest book, uh, I've put together a model of agility, which I think may be of help to you in local government, because, um, you know, people talk about agility all the time. And at the end of the day, it's, it's now becoming a word like uh, human resources or something. And we, we use it um, almost like a cliche. But what we really need to be thinking about is what we mean by agility. What does that actually mean? So when we're agile, what do we actually mean by that? And so what I thought I would do was to design a model around the areas of your business where you think you could be, uh, where you can actually measure agility. So if we start at the top at 12 o'clock, innovation is where you come up with new and different and better ways of doing things and get them out in the marketplace as quickly as you can. Um, that's more likely to be a process than a product or a service. That, that is the way you do things. And there is a lot of scope in local government to be quite creative in terms of the services and how you go about providing those services to the public. Processing is really about, it's a big issue for local government. This is about getting things done as fast as you possibly can through the organisation. So how do we get things through the organisation quickly so that the end user can get what they need or what they've asked for? So that's another form of agility. Another form of agility is when we make mistakes, how quickly can we recover from it? So, you know, how quickly can we um, fix the problem? We all have problems. We all, you know, it doesn't matter how excellent our organisation is is there will always be issues affecting the way we do our business. The question is not, can we, minimize, can we eliminate all those uh, mistakes? The question really is, how can we recover quickly from it? So that's a form of agility. Uh, continuous improvement is a form of agility. How can we be striving to you know, implement uh, tech, technological uh, solutions to things that have been done in a in a in a, in a very much in a in a um, you know in a or you know how do we automate things uh, how do we improve processes how do we make things safer how do we make things faster and so forth so that has to be a dimension of agility the customer responsiveness of course is how we can be more um, responsive to the needs and interests of the communities that we serve. Problem solving is really around how can we go about solving problems quickly and effectively with all of the resources that we need. And of course, elected representatives are dealing with that all the time. And this one here about changing direction is really a culmination of all of these things. And this is how do we uh, change and manoeuvre depending on the circumstances. So for, for many of you in local government, the downturn in the mining industry has obviously led to some serious challenges to your local communities. Um, or, or if we go the other way, you know, a growth centre in an area has also leading to some significant challenges in the way you have to do business. So the model is really there as a means of you being able to evaluate agility at an organisational level. So I think you might find that hopefully quite useful. Now, I do want to talk a little bit around a concept called organisational citizenship. And it's something that I think is a huge opportunity for local government and something that I think you might like to consider. 
It's a great title, isn't it? Organisational citizenship. It's been around for quite a period of time. It's not a new concept, but um, I think it's relatively new that people are doing something about it. Organisational citizenship, and I've given you a definition there, and I'll run through that with you. In organisational, in industrial and organisational psychology, organisational citizenship is a person's voluntary commitment within an organisation that is not part of his or her contractual tasks. So this is about people doing more than what's required on their job description. This is about a person giving back to the organisation. And of course, you might think, well, you know, we're really sort of swimming against the tide there because most people are only concerned with what's on their job description and so forth. But I think one of the reasons for that is that we don't really talk about this concept of organisational citizenship. Now, I'm not suggesting that people, you know, give their life to the organisation. It's not all about that. It's really simply about creating other ways that people contribute, can contribute structurally to the organisation beyond their job, satisfact job description. And the best way that I think you can do that is to do what I suggest. Uh, whoop, I'll go back one level. The best way to do that, in my view, is to create a series of cross-functional teams. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, the cross-functional teams are really uh, an opportunity where you can ask people to be involved in some project teams that can deal with a specific problem or issue that's important. So, um, as I said before, um, I'm doing some work in an area of Queensland Health at the moment. And in this particular part of the organisation, they have created a culture team. And this team is a group of individuals from each particular functional area of the business who come together on a fairly regular basis and they work together to come up with some ways and means of improving the culture of the organisation. So, for example, they look at, you know, putting some notice boards around the building. Um, what goes on those notice boards? They've just produced a really interesting newsletter to improve cross-functional cross communication. So they're doing a lot of really, really exciting things and their energy level is high because they can really feel as if they're contributing beyond their job satisfaction, job description. Now, they don't spend their life working in these teams. They might meet, say, once a month. And, you know, the person that chairs that meeting is not an executive. So they self-select. They work out who that is. They invite people to join the team, depending on their level of interest and so forth. And then what we're attempting to do is to start to look at some other projects now that can be implemented. So, you know, we're looking at a social team that can look at some of the ways and means of uh, creating some social functions for the team. We're looking at rewards and recognition. Um, we're looking at uh, a whole bunch of things. We look. We have an orientation team. This is or we're at least wanting to implement that. And that's a team that thinks about how people can be best um, inducted into the organisation, you know, because it can be a bit of a culture shock if they come from outside health. So what are the things that have to happen? Uh, how will it happen? Who will be involved? And how will it be generic enough to fit in across all the functional areas of the organisation? So my suggestion to you is to start think about that. Now, you might say, oh, well, I'm not the CEO, I can't do that. But you would have some uh, area, I mean, you wouldn't be in this webinar otherwise, you would have some area of responsibility in some functional capacity. So why don't you do it within your own particular department? Why don't you try it and see? You'd be surprised how effective it is.
And of course, there'll be a degree of cynicism about it initially, and people think it's just about squeezing more out of people. But of course, you've got to provide people with the latitude and the opportunity to meet. Now, we're not trying to turn local government into a Google, but Google, as you'd be aware, there's a lot of famous articles about Google giving people time off. So they give people time off once a month when they can work on anything that they choose to work on. And, and they're very, uh, and this, this is one of the most creative things that they do because people are actually doing things that they want to do. I know, and you know, that they wouldn't allow this unless they felt it was commercially viable. In other words, they, they're getting a good return on investment. And you would be the same if you implemented these project teams. So I just want you to have a think about that and how you might implement it, because that's one way that you can change the structure and break down the communication issues and create, and look, it, it's got so many benefits. It, it, it helps people build up their skills. It helps people build up their knowledge. You will create some great ideas from the coalface that hadn't actually been uh, thought of before. Uh, you will create a, some more uh, engagement. You will do a lot of things. Um, and it works really well. And you'll come up with some great ideas um, that will work for you. So that's a thought that you might like to consider in terms of your organisational structure. Here are a couple of other takeaways that I'm hoping that you might get from this um, presentation. And I want you to have a think about how you might apply this in your own workplace. So um, I think that the big challenge, as it says at the top there, is that people who are in the executive actually wear two hats. Uh, they come to the executive meetings with their functional hat, and most of the reporting that occurs at that level is basically done on a functional basis. In other words, you may feel it's your obligation to look after those functional responsibilities, um, and that's how the structure, that's how the organisation is structured, so it's quite natural for you to do that. But I would challenge you that there is another hat that you should bring to those meetings, and that is your leadership hat, organisational leadership hat. And I always believe that any meeting that you attend should be a fine balance between reporting on the one hand and discussion on the other. And the discussion should be around broader uh, concepts than just what people are doing in the various functional areas. And so if you have any uh, authority over, so if you're a CEO or even a member of the executive, I think it'd be good for you to remind your colleagues and, and of course, uh, yourself too, that you wear two hats. And it's important that you bring both hats to those forums or meetings. Um, the agendas um, that you put together should be also cross-functional. What do I mean by that? I think that you should have things on the agenda item which are not things that are directly related to one department or the other. These are things that can be discussed broadly. So um, a good meeting will have, as I say, some discussion and some reporting. But it won't all be reporting, and perhaps it shouldn't all be discussion. And if you're having trouble reconciling those two, I strongly recommend that you have two different meetings and you alternate. You have a reporting meeting, a work in progress meeting, and you have a cross-functional meeting where you talk about broader issues across the department or the organisation I'm sure that would help you a lot. Um, I haven't done this in Queensland yet. I've tried, but we haven't been successful yet. But I'm challenging a number of executive teams across local government in Queensland to rotate the executive. What I mean by that is actually uh, moving people around 
at the executive level so that they're in charge of a function that they're not, it's not their functional specialty. Now, why would we do that? Well, it does a number of really good things. One is it helps that executive to get experience that they wouldn't normally get. So that's obviously in their interest because some of those people are ambitious and perhaps would like to set themselves up to be a CEO one day. So there's obviously a self-interest reason. Another reason is that it can help executives have a greater appreciation of the other areas of the business and how things are done because uh, they're going to be put into situations where they um, perhaps um, are going to face, be faced with novel problems. It also encourages more communication, camaraderie and team building at the executive level because you will be forced to talk to the functional specialist who happens to be in another area when you're faced with a dilemma. Um, it also keeps the next level of management on its toes because they've got a new boss. Now you don't have to do this for a long period. What about if you just did it for six? What, if, what about if you just did it for a month or six months if you're bold enough? You could do that. And I'll guarantee to you that the wheels will not fall off. And uh, because people will be forced to talk to other people to get, you know, the expert uh, perspective. So there's a challenge for you. Or if you're in a department, would you be prepared to try that in your own department, perhaps? Um, I know you'll get a lot of people who jump up and they say, oh, no, 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 I'm quite comfortable where I am. But that's the whole point, isn't it? They're comfortable where they are. We don't want them to be comfortable. We want them to be agile. We want them to be able to see things differently. So there's a thought. What about if you had more cross-functional meetings? What about if you set up some of these cross-functional teams that I've been talking about? And you can do that, and it would be very simple to do. And start with a few. You don't have to do them all. Just start with a few. But if you, if you went for the organisational citizenship model, then what you'd be attempting to do is to have everyone who has an obligation to be part of one of these project teams and be involved in those project teams. Um, I think you'd be surprised how effective that will that works. Um, I think using surveys, I don't think there is enough surveys taken of the public and how things are done uh, in local government. I know some of you do this, but not all of you do. I think there's some benefit in um, getting some benchmark data to be able to work from. Uh, you can do internal surveys around structure as well. Um, and it's easy to construct surveys this day through SurveyMonkey and so forth. If you don't need to get an expert to come in and design that, although having an objective view may well be useful for you. So that could work extremely well for you as such. Okay. Um, and of course, the final point I want to make here is that uh, people are, I often say people are tribal. What I mean by that, of course, is that people will gravitate to a particular tribe, whether we uh, orchestrate it or not. Now, what a lot of people at your level try to do in their careers is to break down the tribal boundaries. In other words, what you're trying to do is to create a generic view of the world, but you need to understand that no matter what you do, people are tribal. So people will form tribes no matter what. The, the more important question for you to ask is, are the tribes that we have, in other words, the organizational structure, are the tribes we have serving us well? And if the answer is no, then you need to create new tribes. But no matter what you do, the tribes themselves will form because people are tribal. So the question is not how do we get rid of tribes. The question is how do we make the tribes work in the interests of everybody 
always a perennial challenge, no doubt. So, guys, there's some thoughts, some ideas, some suggestions about how you might do things differently. And uh, my, uh, my um, encouragement to you is to try something. Do something different. You can use a pilot process. Give it a trial. That saves face. But please don't be caught up in this notion that we should be organising ourselves around functions just because it's always been like that. Remember, you're a leader, and if you don't do something about it, guess what? It probably won't happen. So be bold, be brave, try something new. So, guys, we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, are there any questions that anyone would like to ask me? or any comments that people would like to make where they might have tried some of these things to great advantage and, and you might want to share the success story of that to other people. So I'll just give you a chance to have a think about some of those things before we finish up. Yes, I do give you homework all the time and this is no different and I, the homework that I'm going to give you is to spend some time making some changes to your structure and discuss them with your team for feedback. Can I ask you and challenge you to try something new? What about if you did something that was different and just see how it goes? All right, so I've just got another question here. I've got a couple actually, that's good. Um, let me go to that. Thank you for your clarity of thought. I have 135 staff. Again, thank you. I'll stri strive to move to an environment over the next next uh, 12 months. Well done. Well, that's great to hear. I wish you well in that. And, uh, you know, just try something. See what happens. You know, I think there's not enough innovation in local government, and I think people need to try some things. And if it's not going to happen at your level as a leader, guess what? It probably isn't going to happen, as I said. So your homework is to do just that. Thanks for the question. I've got another one here. Uh, we currently have a culture team and it's working well. Um, thanks, Andrea. That's great to hear. Yeah, of course it's working well because you're giving people that freedom and opportunity and scope to be able to be creative and, and come up with some suggestions. So my challenge to you, Andrea, is what other teams might you formulate, and what are some of the more what are some of the pressing issues? The other thing with all of these project teams is it takes all the pressure off you, because these people can do all the thinking, and then their job is to come to you with some recommendations and suggestions. You don't have to accept them all. They don't expect you to accept them all, but they do expect you to listen, and I'm sure you'd be willing to do that. And if you come up with a great idea, why don't you give it a crack? You already have a, a significant number of people on board anyway, because the old adage is that people don't argue with their own data. They're coming to you with the suggestions. So give it a crack. You be, might be quite pleasantly surprised what can come out of that, just as you have, well, not so much surprised, Andrea, but you've obviously got a culture team that's working well. So good for you. So spend some time making some changes to your structure, discuss them with your team, and by all means, keep in touch with me during the sessions and let me know what works for you because I'd be delighted to hear those suggestions and I'm sure there'll be some good ones coming back. And if you're not sure about how to go about it, just ask me because that's what I'm here for. So guys, thank you for your time. I hope you've got something useful out of that. And uh, we will meet again, of course, in a couple of weeks' time. Um, but uh, the key to all this is to do something different and find the time and the inspiration to do that. So I wish you well. Thank you for the opportunity of working with you again. And uh, have a fantastic week.